we will continue with our discussion on surface tension driven flows. Uh, to summarize, we have uh, discussed about various equations that describe uh, the motion of a fluid in a capillary, in a narrow capillary and <coughs> we have considered uh, both cases one with uh, inertial effects and uh, another without inertial effects. So, all those we have discussed and we have been discussing about certain uh, limitations of the simplified model that we have developed so far. So, we will continue with the limitations of the model. Uh, we have discussed about one limitation and uh, we have introduced the concept of the added mass or the virtual mass. Next, we will dis discuss about the sanctity of the fully developed velocity profile consideration. So, if you look at this schematic, you will see that first there is an entrance region of length L1 where the flow is hydrodynamically developing. This region may be very short, but it will be present. Then there is a fully developed region which is also the equivalently the Poiseuille flow regime and then there is a third regime which is uh, normally not encountered in a channel which is entirely filled with the same liquid. But here there is a channel which is partially filled so that there is a meniscus. Now the velocity profile at the end close to the meniscus should adjust to the shape of the meniscus. Right? You can clearly see that this the shape of the meniscus which is here does not conform to a parabolic velocity profile. Right? Therefore, there is a third regime which is called as the surface traction regime or meniscus traction regime of length L3 where the fully developed velocity profile gradually adjusts to the shape of the meniscus. Okay. So, uh, to summarize there are three regimes, entrance regime or the developing regime, the fully developed regime and the surface traction regime. Now, what regimes will be present? See, it depends on what is the total length of the fluid column. Let us say this total length at some instant this x is equal to x1. Okay. Now, if x1 is less than L1 plus L3, then the fully developed Poiseuille flow regime will, will be absent altogether because you have to remember that there must be a developing region, how small may be it will be there and there must be a meniscus traction regime that is a must because the velocity profile has to adjust to the shape of the meniscus. So, depending on the instantaneous length all the three regimes may be present, but at least the entrance regime will be there and if x is greater than L1, but less than L1 plus L3, then L2 will be 0 and there will be a meniscus traction regime, but no Poiseuille flow regime. Now, when we have considered the drag force or the viscous force, there we have only considered the fully developed Poiseuille flow regime for uh, evaluating the drag force in our calculations. But if you take into account the existence of these two additional regimes, then that will alter the drag force calculation. How it will alter the drag force calculation? That cannot be worked out numerically, but uh, analytically, but through numerical calculations one can do some curve fitting and say that if d f d star d x be, be the gradient of the drag force with a star means fully developed, then the actual one is basically a 1 plus a function of x by hydraulic radius, where the function of x by hydraulic radius can be fitted by a polynomial. So, this is uh, basically not a fundamental analytical work. This is what is this? This is basically uh, curve fitting of numerical data. 
So, doing numerical simulations in the uh, uh, for the cases where all the three regimes are present, then that can be suitably normalized in this particular form, where the gradient of axial gradient of drag force is equal to a factor where the factor is greater than 1 times the gradient of the drag force for a fully developed flow. And the question is how do you calculate the gradient of drag force for a fully developed flow? Let us uh, uh, come to the board and explain that. So, uh, let us say there is a circular capillary of radius r. Now, you take a small control volume of length d x. If the drag force acting on this is d f d, then what is d f d? What is the elemental drag force on this small element? Tau wall into 2 pi r dx. So, this is uh, I mean this dfd this can be expressed in a general case. So, dfd dx is tau wall into 2 pi r this is true no matter whether the flow is fully developed developing whatever. Now, the calculation of tau wall will depend on what is the velocity profile. So, if it is fully developed then u by u average is equal to 2 into 1 minus small r square by capital R square. This is fully developed flow of a Newtonian fluid through a circular tube. So, tau is equal to minus mu du dr that is equal to minus 4 mu u average by into r by r square. So, tau wall, so this minus becomes plus, tau wall is equal to this tau at small r is equal to capital R, this is equal to 4 mu u average by r. So, if you substitute that here, then it is fully developed. So, in that case d f d d x is equal to 8 pi mu u average. Right. So, accounting for the additional regimes the total resistance is this times a magnifying factor, where the magnifying factor depends on uh, where actually you are present and the hydraulic radius or the diameter or, 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 or the actual radius, hydraulic radius is equal to same as the radius for the circular tube, but uh, why we introduce the concept of hydraulic radius is you can use the same concept for tubes with other cross sections not necessarily circular. Okay. The third issue that we discussed is the dynamic evolution of the contact angle. Now, this is a very interesting thing we always say that there is a no slip boundary condition at the interface between the fluid and the solid in, in even in a classical scenario I am for uh, I am not talking about uh, nano channels with hydrophobic interactions all those complicated cases that we have considered. Think about a channel uh, let us come to the board to 
explain this. Think about a channel. Let us come to the board. Yes. Uh, think about a channel. Classical scenario. There is a meniscus. Now, after some time, this meniscus uh, comes here. So, if there is no slip here, then how can this meniscus move like this along the surface? So, somewhere there is a singularity at the fluid solid interface that allows this system or, or this kind of uh, anomaly to be resolved. So, how that is possible? So, let us uh, look into that points on the interfacial lines arrive at the contact line with a finite time span. Therefore, one must pose an effective slip law that relieves a force singularity condition by ensuring that a finite force is necessary to move the contact lines of a fluid irrespective of the no slip boundary condition at the channel wall. So, uh, like you can you can pose a slip law that takes into account the movement of the contact line on the surface. That has nothing to do with how do you derive the velocity profile using the classical no slip boundary condition. So, now how will the contact angle understand that uh, this uh, capillary front is moving? The contact angle also must be sensitive to that. Now, there is a departure of the contact angle from its static equilibrium value mainly due to viscous bending of the interface near the contact lines. So, uh, now how does it vary? Uh, again like uh, uh, it is not so trivial to discuss this at this level. I mean we will be in a position to, uh, uh, to make some analysis on this once we uh, learn thin film flows which we will learn after we study the surface tension driven flows. But for the time being assume there is this and we will understand the consequence of this that the contact angle theta typically scales with capillary number to the power one third. What is capillary number? Capillary number is the ratio of viscous force and the surface tension force that is called as capillary number. So, you can see the definition is written in the view graph that capillary number is equal to mu u by sigma. So, uh, now uh, the contact angle therefore is a function of u and uh, in the mathematical formulation that we had presented there we used a constant contact angle, but in a true sense the contact angle should vary dynamically because the contact line velocity is also varying dynamically. So, there have been various theories which have looked into this issue of dynamic contact angle. I will not uh, get into the theory, but I mean the typically lubrication theory based analysis have been very commonly used. We have discussed about lubrication theory. Now, uh, this entire domain has been classically divided into two regions. One is the outer region. In the outer region, you have the balance between the pressure gradient and the viscous forces and uh, then you have uh, the inner lubrication region as the capillary and the viscous forces balance. Okay. Now, this inner region where the surface tension and the viscous forces balance, this region when it comes very close to the wall, uh, it is a very fine sub region of the inner region where intermolecular forces now come into the picture. And this intermediate intermolecular forces typically originating out of Van der Waals forces of interaction, this kind of intermolecular forces means that there is an excess pressure beyond the capillary pressure and that excess pressure comes in the picture that is called as disjoining pressure. So, that is 
typically uh, an a manifestation of intermolecular forces of interaction that makes the terms to be augmented that makes the pressure term the capillary pressure term to be augmented with another pressure like quantity which is called as disjoining pressure. So, taking all these things into account it may be possible uh, that for weighting fluids a relationship between the like tan theta versus capillary number and a lambda is a surface roughness length scale this uh, relationships have been this this is a relationship that has been obtained in the literature. Uh, the whole purpose of showing this relationship is that uh, like notionally it also follows the simple the scaling of the Tanner's law like capillary number to the power one third behavior. Now so far uh, so good we have understood the limitations of the simple model. But uh, now we will apply this simple model for a special case that is flow of blood through a microcapillary, which is like a very big issue uh, in not only in microfluidics, but also in medical sciences and uh, biofluidics in general. So uh, uh, we will see, uh, uh, let us say that we are analyzing the blood flow through a rectangular channel. So, uh, like when we are considering blood flow through a rectangular channel, uh, you know whatever we did for the circular channel the similar thing, thing will be there in the mathematical modeling paradigm, but the, you know the expressions for uh, the perimeter, area all those things will be different. Uh, you may argue that in human body there is no rectangular channel, right. So, why are we interested about blood flow in rectangular channel? See we are interested about blood flow through both rectangular and circular channels. Circular channels are for the context of human understanding the blood di flow dynamics in a human body and rectangular channels are for artificial lab on a chip devices in which you make pathological tests for blood, blood samples. So, uh, I mean it has relevance in in uh, uh, the I mean it, uh, one need not waste a lot of time to convince ourselves that yes I mean this is a very interesting and important problem the capillary flow dynamics of blood. So uh, uh, like you can see here that like this x1 is like s the parameter s. So ddt of m you can see here we have considered the added mass we have discussed. So, this is the corrected model not the basic model, but the corrected model. So, you have the added mass here m a uh, which for a rectangular channel has this expression. Then uh, this is uh, the mass within the channel that is density into the height into uh, width into x 1. So, that is basically density into volume and then this is d x 1 d t is basically the uh, velocity of the capillary, capillary front. Right hand side this is the surface tension force p into sigma into cos theta where p is the perimeter minus the drag force, drag force is this one tau x y into p d x right integral of that. So, uh, this is a common framework in which you can you can pose almost all problems of capillary filling dynamics, but the question and the very important question is that what is very special that we think about blood. Now typically I will I will uh, briefly talk about uh, uh, the constitutive behavior of blood like actually it is a very important and interesting topic by itself that is how blood as a fluid differs from other fluids. I will uh, uh, discuss a few points about this, but the first and foremost point to understand is that although not in all circumstances, but in many circumstances depending on the shear rate of course, 
blood behaves like a not like a Newtonian fluid. So that means blood will not obey the Newton's law of viscosity. Question is if it does not obey the Newton's law of viscosity then what does it obey? So there are different models of constitutive behavior of blood. So the, the different models like uh, I mean uh, I would name certain models like the Casson model, the power law model, the several viscoelastic types of models because you know blood has deformable blood cells. So it has some partly viscous and partly elastic behavior. So there are wide ranges and different types of model. Now for simplicity and for capturing the very essential physics uh, in this elementary in this basic course uh, we will all only consider the power law model. The reason is that although the power law model uh, does not represent all the important characteristics of blood, but to some extent it, uh, it, it represents the behavior, it represents the behavior quite satisfactorily over the ranges of experiments using which the parameters for the constitutive behavior are chosen. So uh, let me uh, elaborate this point. So typically for a, a generalized power law you can write in this way where this T is called as stress tensor dyadic. So that, that is where uh, these two double marks are there. So uh, I mean we will not get into the details of like what is a tensor dyadic and all those things, but uh, we will be in a position to simply write the expression for a one dimensional scenario. This S is a rate of deformation tensor dyadic and this T star this is like a yield stress tensor dyadic that means it is it is a very common scenario that blood or in general or non Newtonian fluid may not start flowing until and unless a critical stress is applied. So that crit that is like it gives an yield stress like behavior which is very commonly seen for solids many times for certain fluids this yield stress type of behavior can be observed. So uh, uh, now uh, like what typically uh, in, in blood what, what is there? So in blood there is plasma and uh, that will contain its proteins and then there are blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets these blood cells are there. So that makes blood a very complex suspension and this yield stress like behavior in blood is because of a protein called as fibrinogen which is present in the blood. So now if uh, you uh, see that this uh, if you see that uh, what is the value of this, the value of this is not very high and not only that you, you will see that until and unless you start the blood from 0 velocity condition to a flowable condition this may not be that important. This may be important when you start the blood from a 0 velocity to a finite velocity condition. Otherwise if the blood is already in a moving condition then this may not be that important and typically uh, uh, we will uh, not so much uh, we will put not so much attention on this term just for algebraic simplicity but it will not uh, bear a lot of significance on what whatever we are going to derive but this is not actually 0. But if you take away very interestingly if you take away the fibrinogen from the blood sample then this will be 0. So uh, like in, in biology these, these are very common things 
So, if you say, say you observe certain behavior and you say that this is possibly because of fibrinogen, then that possibly has to be justified. That means, then you take away the fibrinogen out of it and show that that effect is not there. Then only that can be, it can be proved that yes, it is because of fibrinogen. Uh, there are of course, other proteins like albumin, globulin and uh, these, these other types of proteins are there. Now, so we will not concentrate so much on this. Now, for a one dimensional scenario, where there is velocity gradient along one particular direction. So, now this is what, what is basically, this is what, this is basically the rate of deformation gamma dot. And for a one dimensional situation, this is du dy. So, that means we can write tau is equal to k into du dy to the power n. This k and n are two very important parameters like for a mathematician these are just two parameters, but somebody who is working with a biological problem to solve then this k and a and n are just not arbitrary mathematical parameters. So, this k is known as flow consistency index. and this n is known as flow behavior index. So, tau versus n I uh, sorry tau versus d u d y if you make a plot for different values of n you can make a plot. So, the common situation is the Newtonian fluid for which n is equal to 1. So, you know that Newtonian fluid with an yield stress that is something which is like a Bingham type of behavior. So, there you will have a shift of this. So, that, that you do not call as the Newtonian fluid because it will have a yield like characteristic, but beyond the, beyond the yield point it can have a linear stress versus strain. I am not drawing all the plots just to give you some idea. Then there are fluids and blood closely resembles that that is called a pseudo plastic fluid. So, what is a pseudo plastic fluid? Pseudoplastic fluid is a fluid for which the apparent viscosity, what is apparent viscosity? You can write tau is equal to k into du dy to the power n minus 1 into du dy. Why you are casting it in this form is because then this is like an apparent mu just to have the re resemblance with the Newton's law of viscosity. So, if it were, if it could be treated as a Newtonian fluid, what could be the possible viscosity that is called as apparent viscosity and the apparent viscosity will depend on the shear rate. So, typically that occurs for n less than 1 that the apparent viscosity is actually decreasing with increase in shear rate. So, for n less than 1, so typically what is happening in blood? See blood has blood cells and these cells are soft and deformable. So, at low value of shear, these cells will, cells may form agglomerates or aggregates and that might increase the apparent viscosity. But at high shear rates, these soft cells can be deformed 
and then that will actually increase the flowability or reduce the effective viscosity. However, if hardness of the cell is increased, say, say because of some disease the cell has become very hard, then this behavior will change dramatically. That means, rheology of the blood can carry the signature of a disease in the blood sample. Currently, we are trying to devise medical diagnostic protocols that will identify disease based on rheology, then we do not have to get into a chemical based detection of the blood sample. So, this is a fluid dynamic way of detecting diseases. So, I am just giving you a perspective that why are we studying all this, because eventually we will be doing some mathematics, but we have to understand that what is the broad picture that is there. N less than 1, this is pseudoplastic. n greater than 1 that is called as dilatant. That means, it is apparent viscosity. So, this is n less than 1, this is n equal to 1 and maybe let us draw with a different color. This is n greater than 1. So, n greater than 1 examples like say soft tissues. I am just giving biological examples, I mean because we are talking about that. So, soft tissues if you strain them, it becomes harder and harder to strain them further and further. So, that means their ap apparent viscosity if you call that as a fluid, see at this level of material for this type of material, the, the sanctity of the definition of a fluid is under question whether it is fluid or solid or whatever, it, we simply call it is a material and the material has some constitutive behavior. So, we can see not only that the apparent viscosity of the blood may also be a strong function of time. That means, you leave the blood sample and you may see that actually you have a reduction in the effective viscosity of the blood as you allow more and more time or as you strain more and more. So, it may be possible just I am drawing a hypothetical picture that you have a hysteresis. You this is the forward experiment, the backward if you do maybe you come along the same line yeah, along a different line. So, the dependence of the apparent viscosity with time and in fact, the reduction of the apparent viscosity with time makes blood a strongly time dependent uh, uh, or gives blood a strongly time dependent rheological characteristic and this particular characteristic is known as thixotropic. So, blood is also called as a thixotropic fluid. However, the time scale over which we are doing experiments in the microfluidics may not be uh, like large enough to uh, have significant uh, to, to be significantly influenced by the thixotropy of the blood sample. So, we are neglecting thixotropy for our analysis, but see there are certain things which we are neglecting, but we have to keep in mind that these effects are important these effects cannot be ruled out. They are not important always, but for certain cases they are. Now, uh, for n less than 1, what happens as you go for a large value of strain? What happens? what will happen to the apparent viscosity? It will be tending to 0, right. So, you can see that that is not actually a correct physical behavior. So, actually the power law model is not a very mathematically correct model to describe the behavior of uh, for example, a fluid like blood, but over the ranges of parameters for which we are doing experiments, 
if these parameters k and n are appropriately fitted, we will see how they are fitted. Then it may be possible that by using this law, one can capture a significant level of the physical behavior of blood through this model. Now what we will do is we will use this power law model and try to derive what is the change that means what is the drag force in a circular capillary because of the flow of a power law fluid. So we will uh, uh, basically deal with Navier Stokes uh, not Navier Stokes equation the Navier equation no more Navier Stokes equation because it is non Newtonian fluid right. So we have to be careful I mean sometimes loosely because we are always doing mostly with Newtonian fluids we loosely have a tendency to, to like use Navier Stokes equation for anything and everything but uh, we because it is a non Newtonian fluid we will start with the Navier's equation and not the Navier Stokes equation and the Navier's equation in a cylindrical coordinate system because we are using circular capillary. So uh, uh, we will uh, do that I mean I will write the Navier's equation for the, the axial component of the momentum it is impossible for me to remember it or, or reproduce it properly. So I will uh, just reproduce it from my notes. So rho we have neglected any body force otherwise there will be a rho into body force there this is z momentum expressed in terms of the stress but stress is not related to rate of deformation. So uh, depending on st how is stress related to rate of deformation you can further simplify this equation. So we will start with this again this is not Navier Stokes equation okay. So now we are considering steady flow so this is equal to 0 fully developed flow that means V r equal to 0 no variation with respect to theta because it is axially symmetric and fully developed flow so V z is not a function of z okay. So the geometry that we are discussing is this is a circular capillary and the axial direction is the z direction. Then this term is 0 and this term is also 0. So you are left with one by r del del r of yes what is tau z z depends on what huh? which tau z z depends on which derivative of v z or which derivative of v z it is v z derivative with respect to z and that is 0 for fully developed flow. So tau rz 
into R is equal to del P del Z. Now, tau R Z will be equal to minus k okay this minus sign is to add the uh, adjust to the coordinate system see when you write uh, du dy then in the in the law of uh, in the constitutive behavior there there that y is normal away from the wall and here this r is normal towards the wall so just to make an adjustment to that you actually have this minus sign okay so uh, that means you have uh, now we will use this form subsequently now we what we will do is we will first integrate this so tau r z r is equal to now this is a function of r only this is a function of z only therefore each is equal to constant so this will be dp dz so dp dz which is a constant into r square by 2 plus c1 right now at r equal to 0 tau rz is equal to 0 right why at r equal to 0 tau rz should be 0 because of the symmetry in the velocity profile so that means you have c1 equal to 0 so tau rz is equal to dp dz into r by 2 okay we have to keep in mind so how do you get wall shear stress just substitute small r equal to capital r and you can see that the wall shear stress will not depend on k or n i mean wall shear stress but this is an illusion the relationship between wall shear stress and pressure gradient does not depend on k and n, but wall shear stress will definitely depend on k and n, because wall shear stress can be calc will be fundamentally calculated from the velocity profile. So, it is not that the wall shear stress is independent of k and n, but the relationship between wall shear stress and dp dz will be independent of k and n. Okay. Anyway, so we will proceed further tau r z that is equal to in place of tau r z we will write minus k d v z d r to the power n. So we can write d v z d r is equal to minus 1 by 2 k dp dz to the power 1 by n into r to the power 1 by n right. Just for algebraic simplicity we will call it some parameter a. So, dvz dr is equal to a r to the power 1 by n. So, then vz is equal to what? a r to the power 1 by n plus 1 divided by 1 by n plus 1 plus 
C2. The second boundary condition at small r is equal to capital R, Vz is equal to 0, no slip boundary condition. That means 0 is equal to A capital R to the power 1 by n plus 1 by 1 by n plus 1 plus C 2. So, let us write the velocity profile then. So, V z is equal to A by 1 by n plus 1 into small r to the power 1 by n plus 1 then minus capital R to the power 1 by n plus 1. Now, what is the next step? This A contains d p d z. How do we eliminate d p d z? we will express A in terms of the average velocity, right. So, what is the average velocity V average or U average whatever name you give, V average is integral V z into 2 pi r dr divided by pi r square, flow rate by the cross sectional area. So, that is 2 a by 1 by n plus 1 right 2 a by 1 by n plus 1 into r square integral of this into r dr right. So, r to the power 1 by n plus 2 minus capital R to the power 1 by n plus 1 into r dr. So, 2 a by 1 by n plus 1 r square this becomes r to the power 1 by n plus 3 by 1 by n plus 3 minus r to the power 1 by n plus 2 uh, sorry r to the power 1 by n plus 3 1 then the r square will make it 3 divided by 2 right. So, this will become r to the power 1 by n plus 1, if you cancel one this r square, then you can cancel this 2 divided by 1 by n plus 1 into 1 by 1 by n plus 3 minus this 2 is there. Right? A is there, yes. So, this will become 2 minus 1 by n minus 3. So, minus of 1 by n plus 1, right. So, this will become 
2 r to the power 1 by n plus 1 a by 1 by n plus 1 by 2 into 1 by n plus 3 then minus of 1 by n plus 1. All right. Then this 1 by n plus 1 gets cancelled, 2 gets cancelled. So, minus a r to the power 1 by n plus 1 divided by 1 plus 3 n, then n in the numerator. Therefore, you can write a is equal to minus 1 plus 3 n into V average by n into r to the power 1 by n plus 1, right. We will substitute this A in this to express V in terms of V average. So, V z is equal to n by 1 plus n. Now, in place of A, we will write minus 1 plus 3 n into V bar by n r to the power 1 by n plus 1 into r to the power 1 by n plus 1 minus r to the power 1 by n plus 1. n gets cancelled. So, V z by V average is equal to 1 plus 3 n by 1 plus n into 1 minus small r by capital R to the power 1 by n plus 1. Okay. You can quickly check the result by putting n equal to 1. So, if it is if n equal to 1, it becomes 4 by this. So, 2. So, V z by V average is equal to 2 into 1 minus small r by capital R square. That is the hagen poizoli flow velocity profile. Okay. So, you can see that once you get this velocity profile, then you have everything. So, you can calculate the wall shear stress. you can calculate the wall shear stress that is minus k into d v z d r to the power n at small r is equal to capital R. And this v is your d s v bar is your d s d t, this is d s d t. And your drag force is equal to tau wall into perimeter into S. If it is a fully developed flow, it is uh, like over the entire S, the same tau wall is there. Otherwise, you have to take a small element dx and integrate over that. Right? If you consider the other regimes, that is the developing regime, the meniscus traction regime and so on. But here we have dealt with mainly the fully developed flow. So, the drag force this is F d star as per our notation that is fully developed flow drag force. This depends on what? This depends on the parameter n right. So, this parameter n is very important to dictate the capillary flow dynamics by dictating the viscous resistance. And this parameter n depends on the hematology of the blood sample. So, how does it depend? We will discuss about that in the next class. For the time being, thank you very much. <laughs>